Hi there, chapter 31. Um, at the end of chapter 30, um, Odd had just gotten um, Stormy to sleep and had kind of snuck away in order to leave the police there to watch her instead of him. And um, he was headed home. So, um, all right, chapter 31. My salvage yard furniture, too scarred and tacky to meet the standards of the thrift shops that sold to Stormy. My paperback books neatly arranged on shelves made of stacked bricks and boards. My framed posters of Quasimodo as played by Charles Lofton and Hamlet as played by Mel Gibson. An E.T. from the movie of the same name, three fictional characters with whom I identify for different reasons. The cardboard Elvis perpetually smiling. From the open doorway in which I stood, everything appeared to be as it had been when I'd left for work Tuesday morning. The door had been locked and bore no signs of a forced entry. Circling the building, I had noticed no broken windows. Now I was torn between leaving the door open to facilitate a hasty exit and locking it to prevent anyone from entering at my back. After too long a hesitation, I quietly closed the door and engaged the deadbolt. Except for the occasional church chur and coo of a night bird that filtered through two screen windows I'd left open for ventilation, the hush was so profound that a drop of water in the kitchenette fell from faucet to sink pan with a plonk that quivered my eardrums. Certain that I was meant to pick up the gun, easily resisting its allure, I stepped over the weapon. One of the benefits of living in a single room, the armchair a few steps from the bed, the bed a few steps from the refrigerator, is that the search for an intruder takes less than a minute. Your blood pressure hasn't the time to rise to stroke inducing levels when you need only look behind the sofa and in a single closet to clear all possible hiding places. Only the bathroom remained to be searched. The door was closed. I had left it open. After a shower, I always leave it open because the bathroom has a single small window, hardly more than a porthole, and an exhaust fan that makes all the noise of, but stirs less air than, a drum set hammered by a heavy metal musician. If I didn't leave the door open, the bath would be ruled by aggressive mutant molds with a taste for human flesh, and I would be forced henceforth to bathe in the kitchen sink. Unclipping the phone from my belt, I considered calling the police to report an intruder. If officers arrived and found no one in the bathroom, I would look foolish, and scenarios occurred to me in which I might appear worse than merely foolish. I glanced at the gun on the floor. If it had been placed with careful calculation, with the intent that I should pick it up, why did someone want me to have possession of it? After putting the phone on the breakfast counter, I stepped to one side of the bathroom door and listened intently. The only song sounds were the periodic song of the night bird, and after a long pause, the plonk of another water drop in the kitchen sink. The knob turned without resistance. The door opened inward. Someone had left a light on. I am diligent about conserving electricity. The cost may be only pennies, but a short order cook who hopes to marry cannot afford to leave lights burning or music playing for the pleasure of the spiders and spirits that might visit his quarters in his absence. With the door open wide, the small bathroom would offer nowhere for an intruder to hide except in the bathtub behind the closed shower curtain. I always close the curtain after taking a shower because if I left it drawn to one side, it would not dry properly in that poorly vented space. Mildew would at once set up housekeeping in the damp folds. Since I'd left Tuesday morning, someone had pulled the curtain aside. That person, or another, was at this moment face down in the bathtub. He appeared to have fallen into a tub. Excuse me. He had fear, appeared to have fallen into the tub, or to have been tumbled there as a dead weight. No living person would lie in such an awkward position, face pressed to the drain, his right arm twisted behind his body at a torturous angle that suggested a dislocated shoulder or even a torn rotator cuff. The fingers of the exposed pale hand were curled into a rigid claw. They did not twitch, neither did they tremble. Along the far rim of the tub, a thin smear of blood had dried on the porcelain. When blood is spilled in quantity, you can smell it. This is not a foul odor when fresh, but subtle and crisp and terrifying. I couldn't detect the faintest scent of it here. A glistening spill of liquid soap on the tile counter around the sink and thick soap scum in the bowl suggested that the killer had washed his hands vigorously after the deed, perhaps to scrub away blood or traces of incriminating gunpowder. After drying, he had tossed the hand towel into the tub. It covered the back of the victim's head. 
Without conscious intent, I had backed out of the bathroom. I stood just beyond the open door. My heart played an inappropriate rhythm for the melody of the night bird. I glanced toward the gun on my carpet, just inside the front door. My instinctive reluctance to touch the weapon had proven to be wise, although I still didn't grasp the full meaning of what had transpired here. My cell phone lay on the breakfast counter, and the apartment phone was on the nightstand beside my bed. I considered those whom I could, should call and those I could call. None of my options appealed to me. To better understand the situation, I needed to see the face of the corpse. I returned to the bedroom. I bent over the tub, avoiding the hooked and twisted fingers. I clutched handfuls of his clothing and with some struggle rest, wrestled the dead man onto his side and then onto his back. The towel slid off his face. Still a washed out gray, but devoid now of their characteristic eerie amusement, Bob Robertson's eyes were more sharply focused in death than in life. His gaze fixed intently on a distant vision, as though in the final instant of existence, he had glimpsed something more startling and far more terrifying than just the face of his killer. All right, damn. That is chapter 31. Damn. Someone killed Bob Robertson. All right, see you next time. Chapter 32.